glad to have Dale Marshfield come at this time and share with us from the Word of God. Uh, Dale and I go back farther than 1980, almost a decade before that. We met one another at Morrisville State University in 1972. Dale was a veterinary science major at that time. I was a forestry major, and he's one of the two guys that discipled me. He was fully mature. He'd been saved for a whole year, and uh, I had just come to know Christ as my Savior, and Dale was one of the two guys, he and a, man named, a guy named John Austin, who uh, became my mentors, my models, my... Uh, my uh, my helpers in so many ways. I was, a, I was addicted to alcohol. They pulled me out of that old life. Uh, they would not give up on me. And I've said to Dale and John hundreds of times, I owe you my life. And I'm grateful for the input, not only in those first, in those first uh, 12 months of my new life in Christ, but for the example and friendship over all these years. And I was thrilled to find that Bible Baptist supported the Marshfields when we moved here in 04. And Dale, it's a delight to have you with us. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Well, I, I, <laughs> thank you. I truly appreciate my friendship with Ron and Val, and um, I was in their wedding. They were in our wedding, and uh, we are grateful for the way God continues to use the two of you in his great harvest field. We, um, when Ron always says, you know, when Ron says that I help mentor him, uh, John and I were oblivious. We had no idea. I mean, we were so young in the Lord, and we were in this campus in Morrisville, New York, where by midterm, a third of the student body was on academic probation because they were drinking in the pubs that were, that was all this was in this town. And uh, we just thought, wow, we don't know much. It seems like we know a little bit more than most people here. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. Um, it really was great. It was a great year. God used that year in my life to set the direction that he had for me, um, you know, without me really knowing that he was doing that, and Ron was a big part of that, as were a number of other people. We do appreciate the opportunity to be in your missions conference. Uh, this is a special time for a church, isn't it? Uh, you invest, as, a, as an assembly, you invest a lot in missions. Uh, you pray a lot. I know that you do. Uh, you free up your pastor to minister to missionaries. You give significantly. And then uh, to take time once a year and to just kind of renew your vision, to, to think afresh about why you're doing all this and how important it is. And it really is important. And, and the difference that it's making globally, uh, that's a great time. And, and we, Karen and I, count it a privilege to be with you. We appreciate the long partnership that we've had together and I can remember coming here the first time and you had kettle drums up here. It's like the only church I'd ever been in that had these big copper kettle drums. Do you remember that? How many of you remember those? Wow. Okay. Great. There's still some old timers here. Sorry. <clears throat> well, this morning I want to uh, pray with you and then I'd like to look at one of the servant psalms, Isaiah chapter 42. But we, before we turn there, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that we can gather this morning and that we can worship you. Uh, we thank you for the songs that we've sung that reminded us of uh, your great glory, how worthy you are of everything that, that you, you do, uh, of all the worship and all of the praise that rises from your people. You are worthy of the worship that does not arise from this earth and that is given to lesser gods and to human beings that you created for your glory. And this troubles us greatly. And we pray that as we open your word today and as we think about your great servant and about our walking in his footsteps, that we would be challenged, uh, that our perspective would re be renewed and that we would be encouraged in this great task of bringing the light to the Gentiles and to all nations. Thank you for this church. I thank you for uh, the many missionaries that have been sent out of this church. I thank you for the long history of investment in world evangelism, for uh, all that has been done through prayer as, as many people in this church have labored before your throne, uh, interceding for missionaries and for lost people globally. And we just pray that you would continue to bless this work and to use it for your glory. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to read Isaiah 42. It's one of these great servant psalms. There are five of them in the book of Isaiah. And a servant song is probably a, a bad title, but it's one that somebody somewhere along the way gave to these, these oracles, and it has stuck. 
So we'll just, uh, we'll just use it. But Isaiah 42 is the first of these five servant songs, and I'm just going to read the first nine verses. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out, nor raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching, the islands will, be, will put their hope. This is what the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from, dark, from, from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. I want to think with you this morning about some perspectives that we need for reaching the world. And I, I don't think that these will be new to most of you, but I hope that they will encourage you and just kind of renew your vision for world evangelism. It's a funny thing about perspective. Have you ever noticed how you can get something in mind and then it doesn't matter how, uh, how many facts to the contrary appear before you, you just think that way. I don't know, maybe I'm just like that. I, was, I travel a lot uh, with the Lord, ministry that the Lord has given me. I get to travel, and, and so I spend a lot of time on airplanes and in airports, and, and that's no big deal to me. But I did something uh, not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, actually, where I missed a flight. Uh, I was coming home, which is the worst flight to miss because I always am really eager to get home. But uh, I got in my mind, I looked at the itinerary that I had uh, for this flight, and it said 3 o'clock. And for some reason, when I looked at that, I thought, great, 3 in the afternoon. I finished teaching Friday, fly out Saturday at 3 in the afternoon. And that was in my head. And I must have looked at that itinerary three, four, five times in the course of the three weeks that I was in India. But in my mind, every time I looked at it, I kept thinking, oh, good, I can go out for a run Saturday morning, I'll be able to do a few things, and then off to the airport. Well, I'm in the cab going to the airport at about, I don't know, 12 o'clock Saturday afternoon, and, I, and for some reason, all of a sudden, something clicks. And I think, that said 3.00. That's probably 24-hour time. It was actually 3 in the morning the night before, or the morning, that morning. I had missed my flight. I got, I, by the time I got to the airport, somehow I realized that, but it never dawned on me. Every time I looked at that itinerary, I assumed it was three in the afternoon. And we tend to be like that. Once we get something in mind, doesn't matter how many facts we see to the contrary, that's the way we see something. And uh, the same thing is true in the positive area. When we get the right perspective about reaching the nations, it's going to completely influence the way we look at our lives. It's going to influence the way we look at our church. It's going to influence the way we look at our money at everything else that we do. And so I want to talk with you today out of this uh, servant song about three perspectives that we need for reaching the world. Now, before we do that, we probably ought to talk a little bit about what these servant songs are all about. There are, as I said, there are five of them. They occur in Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50. 52 and 53 together, and then in Isaiah chapter 61. And they are great songs that, that most people recognize pretty quickly are about the Messiah. Uh, one of the best known of them is, is Isaiah 53, the one that talks about the suffering servant of the Lord. But then there are others that talk about various aspects of the Lord's uh, ministry as the servant of God. Uh, the one that we're looking at this morning, Isaiah 42, is quoted 
in Matthew chapter 12, actually a lengthy quote of it, and applied directly to Christ. So we know that it's talking about Christ, and that these are songs that talk about Christ as he served the Lord here on earth in order to accomplish God's work. But they're more than that. They are that. That's supremely what they are. Uh, commentators have argued for years about, well, do they apply to Israel? Do they apply to the remnant? Do they apply to the Messiah? And, and in reality, they probably apply to all of those because there's more to them than that. And the interesting thing is when you come to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul got his marching orders from some of these songs. In Acts chapter 13, when he is uh, being rejected by the Jews, he says, we must go to the Gentiles as it is written of us. And he quotes from Isaiah 49, one of these servant songs. And then when you look at Paul's own commission, it's hard not to hear the language from the end of the one that we read, where it says, I will make you to be a covenant of people, a light to the Gentiles, to open the eyes of the blind. Doesn't that sound like what the Lord told Paul he should do when he commissioned him? Yes, it does. And so even though these servant songs portray the way Jesus Christ would serve his Father on earth, they also indicate how we should serve God on this earth. In a sense, every single believer should take their cues from the servant of the Lord. Now, there's something else about them that I want us to think about before we get started looking at Psalm 42, and that is that every, well, not all of them, but, but some of them seem to have this global vision. We already read about uh, in, in verse 4 here, where it says that in the islands will find their hope in the teaching of the Lord, and, and this servant is going to be a light to the Gentiles, and he's going to bring liberty to all people. In chapter 49, in verse 6, it says, I will make you as a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. So whatever this servant was going to do, it wasn't only going to bring blessing and the realization of promise to the people of God, the nation of Israel, but it was going to extend well beyond that. And it was going to bring God's salvation to the ends of the earth. This is a theme in chapter 52, in verse 14. He talks about the fact that he will sprinkle many nations through the work of this servant. So it's about a global impact of the servant of God. Well, let's think then about the perspectives. If these things have to do with reaching the world, let's think for a moment about the perspectives that we need to have. And the first four verses, the thing that strikes me immediately and I think stands out very clearly is for perspective number one, and this is the perspective of your conference, it all depends on God. In the strength of the Lord, that's your theme, right? And when we read these first four verses, it is so clear that it all depends upon God. He says here, here's my servant. An interesting beginning to this little song. In the NIV, the word here is uh, the same that has been used, the same word that has been used in verse 29 where it says see. It's behold. And, and he begins this psalm by saying, here is my solution. Now, we sort of have to set it in context because in Isaiah chapter uh, 41 in verse 22, the prophet has been talking about the impotence of the idols, and he's kind of mocking them. And in verse 22, he says, tell us, you idols, what is going to happen? He begins to kind of decry the idolatry of the nation and the idolatry of the nations and the fact that, that people put their hope in other than the living and the true God. And he says, which of you idols can foretell what is going to happen? And then he says, a little bit later, he says, if you would only do something, uh, do something so we can know that you're there. And then finally in verse 29, he says, behold, they are all false their deeds amount to nothing. Their images are but a wind and confusion. That in which you are hoping, that in which you are trusting is nothing. But behold, here is my solution. Behold, here is my servant, whom I will uphold, whom I have chosen, whom I will put my spirit upon, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. And so right away we see that, that the, the language is strongly, God is going to do something through his servant. It all 
will depend upon God. You know, when we think about this, this taking our cues from the servant of the Lord, if Christ so fully depended upon God to accomplish everything that he accomplished, how much more us? It all depends upon God. Notice with me here, first of all, um, I mean, this was definitely true of Jesus Christ. Uh, notice the first thing that he says here uh, in the passage. He says, Behold my servant, whom I will uphold, my chosen one. Now, if everything depends upon God, then one of the first things that strikes us here is that God chooses the person for the work. Here, this servant of mine is my chosen one. I have chosen him to do this. We don't choose what we're going to do in God's vineyard. God chooses the person for the work. Jesus, when he was on earth, said, I have brought you glory in John 17, 4. I've brought you glory on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. He's very clear that this was something the Father entrusted to him. John the Baptist understood this. He said, uh, remember when uh, disciples were beginning to follow Jesus? And uh, his disciples got a little bit worried about that. And they said, you know, everybody's going after them. And, and John said to them, he said, don't worry about that. A man can only receive what is given him from heaven. God chooses the person for the work. And, and that is equally true of us, but it's a little bit harder for us, isn't it? I mean, Jesus, the Father spoke directly to him. John the Baptist spoke to, God spoke directly to him. But for us, even though it's equally true, sometimes we struggle, well, what is the work you have chosen me for? In this great harvest of the nations, what is my part? What is my role? One of the great things about this conference is that we have people from all sorts of ministries, doing all sorts of things in order to fuel and extend the gospel globally. Now, of course, when we think about our, what God has chosen us to do in the, in the harvest, uh, obviously the word of God is our first approach here. What does the word of God say that we're supposed to do? And even though that is really simple, it's amazing how we trip over that one. Uh, how often we forget that, that it is simply obeying what God has said in his word is the, is the clearest route to finding out what he has chosen for us to do in his harvest. And we will tend to neglect that and we'll tend to, to look for something a little more exciting than that, but, but that's the route that God wants us to go. He has chosen you for what you passionately believe in. How do you know what he's chosen you for? Well, I don't think that he's chosen you to do something you do not passionately believe in. When, when I hear Donna talk about her ministry to missionary families and to MKs, I get this strong sense that she passionately believes in what she's doing, that she sees there's a tremendous need for that, and indeed there is. But that may not be true of all of you here. You may not see that, and that's okay. God tends to put this desire for the thing that he wants us to do, that he has chosen us to do in our heart. And we begin to be passionate about that. We believe it's important. When I was uh, in Bible college and preparing for ministry, I just couldn't think that God wanted me to do anything else other than go overseas. And, and my wife had the same perspective. Uh, when we met, that was on our minds. It's something we passionately believed in. We loved ministry. We loved evangelizing. We loved discipling people. But for both of us, we passionately longed to go overseas and to do this where there, there were less opportunities for people to hear the gospel. So, sure, it's harder to figure out what God has chosen us to do, but if we follow the Word of God, if, if we just pay attention to what we passionately believe in, and then if... Uh, we, we pay attention to what God has entrusted to us. I think it's a, a simple but true principle. We know the things for which he's chosen us by the things he entrusts to us. What has God entrusted to you? What abilities has he given you? What relationships has he given to you? 
God entrusts things to us, and, and these are the things that, that are an indication of the work that he's chosen us to do. Uh, he's, not going to, he's not going to call you to a work or lead to a work that you have no ability for. If he hasn't entrusted you that ability, that ability to you, then obviously that's not the direction that he wants you to go. It's interesting that in John 17 and verse 9, Jesus said, I pray for them. Now, I'm not praying for the world, but for those that you have given me, for they were yours, but you've given them unto me. You've entrusted these men to me. I've been faithful to them. I've given them your word. I've invested my life in them. Why? Because you entrusted them to me. So what has God entrusted to you? I think that uh, in life often dreamers sacrifice what is trusted, entrusted to them in the pursuit of of some hypothetical calling. And, and I'm not talking about necessarily monetary things. I'm talking about relationships. and I'm talking about abilities. And, and dreamers tend to sacrifice what is entrusted to them as they pursue some sort of hypothetical calling rather than focusing on what is entrusted to them, utilizing what is entrusted to them, pursuing what is entrusted to them. Paul's principle is pretty simple here. It's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful to that. And I think that um, when we think about what work has God chosen me for, think about what he's entrusted you to, to you, uh, what you're a steward of, and pursue that. So his choice, God chooses the people for the work, but it's clear in this passage when we think about this all depends upon God. It's not just that he chooses people for the work, but that he also empowers them for the work. It says, here's my servant whom I uphold. And then he says, this is the one in whom I delight. And this is the one on whom I will put my spirit. Three very clear indications that God empowers the work to which, into which he leads us. There is nothing as empowering as the delight of God. Isn't that true? I mean, if you're a parent, you know this in the lives of your children. Your children, when they sense your delight, they respond positively to that. They respond uh, cooperatively to that. And the same thing is true with God. Uh, Jesus, when he was, it's not for, it's for good reason that when Jesus was baptized and he began his earthly ministry, the father spoke and said, this is my son, the one in whom I'm delighting. I'm well pleased with him. As a man that spoke to the heart of Christ and encouraged him and empowered him. God speaks these words of encouragement into our hearts. And of course, that's why he says to us in Ephesians that we need to find out what pleases the Lord, that we need to pursue those things that that please God so that we might enjoy his pleasure in our, life, in our lives. But you'll also notice that the passage goes on. It's not, it depends upon God, and he chooses us for the work, and he empowers us for the work, but then we need to do the work the way that he calls us to do it. And, and this is, is stated here in verse uh, 2. He says, of, of the servant of the Lord, he will not cry, shout out, or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. The servant would go about his work in a way that would demonstrate absolute dependence upon the Father. Unlike conquering generals, unlike the way in which religion tended to spread in the ancient world where a conqueror would come in with violence and with force and would ultimately impose his religion upon the followers... This one would not shout out in the streets. This one would not call attention to himself. And, and so there's a certain way of going about God's work that demonstrates dependence upon God. I think probably, I mean, it's always easy to say we're depending upon the Lord. It's always easy to attach a praise the Lord to something, you know, well, praise the Lord, that, that was God's work. But the truth of the matter is the way we approach our work for God is the clearest indication whether we're really trusting God, whether we're manipulating things, or whether we're using coercion. Or, uh, those are all the kinds of things that are hinted at there in verse 2. He won't shout out or raise his voice in the streets. I suppose that could, could refer to the fact of violence, aggression, coercion. 
Or it could simply refer to the fact that, that he wouldn't seek to draw attention to himself. I think in our modern world, and especially in our American culture, it's almost impossible for us to think that God can work mightily through someone without drawing significant attention to the individual. But that's not true, and globally that isn't a perception that people have. I mean, if you're in Asia, drawing attention to yourself can get you locked up in prison, as some communist officials have found in China recently. Jesus' brothers couldn't understand this. You remember in John chapter 7 when they are talking with him and they say, are you going up to the feast? And he says, oh no, I'm not going to go. And he says, and his brothers say this to him. They say, no one that wants to be a public official does things in, this, in the background. Show yourself to the world. They didn't get it. He wasn't trying to be a public figure. He wasn't trying to draw attention to himself. He was simply doing what his father wanted him to do. And that's what he said. He said, your time is your own. You can do whatever you want. But my time is not my own. I'm following orders here. See, the way we do our work demonstrates whether we're truly dependent upon God or whether we're just using all of the machinations and all of the, the vehicles that the world has to accomplish the kind of results that the world can bring about. But you notice as well that this method, and it's one of the things that is most characteristic of our Lord and most counter-cultural with regard to his ministry. It says there in verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not stuff out. He will create space for the weak. He will create space. And, and the metaphors are pretty clear and I suppose we could try to make a lot out of them. A bruised reed, a reed that, that doesn't seem to have any usefulness or is about to be broken. A, a smoldering wick in, a, in an oil lamp. It's not quite there. There's just a little bit of strength left in it. And in the values of the world, you tend to brush these things aside. You tend to see no room for them. But in Christ's world, it was the weak that found a space in his ministry. It was the struggling, it was the downtrodden, it wasn't the, the powerful of his day. They, they seemed to have no space for him because he had space for the weak. And out of the weak, just as, as Matt was saying to us in Sunday school, out of that, that weak, smoldering, uh, the smoldering wick of men and women that he gathered around him, those broken reeds of men and women that, that came to follow him, he changed the world through them. Amazing. How did that happen? It's the power of God. He selected the most unlikely people and under the influence of his ministry and under the influence of the power of his father, they did not remain the most unlikely people. They became the heroes of the church, didn't they? I mean, when we think of Peter and Paul and of James and of John and we think of these men, we think of them as the great examples of our faith, those in whose footsteps we want to follow. That's what they became under the power of God. But that's not what they were when Christ found them. And I think there's a great principle there. He found them, he created space for the weak so that he could make mighty men and women out of them. That's what God does. That's what a ministry does that is dependent upon God. And so we find that, that this process of world evangelism is just filled with the examples of those who were weak. I was in India a couple of weeks ago with a, a pastor, J.D. Enosh, and um, he is a, was a village boy, grew up in one of these Indian villages that are, are just uh, so undeveloped and, and just uh, there's so much evil that happens in them. And he's a Dalit man, an untouchable, a low caste man. And God saves him. And amazingly enough, doesn't leave him in that condition. Begins to empower him and raise him up and, and leads him to some people that can teach him the word of God and can train him. And, and lo and behold, he meets a woman who's a higher caste woman who because of her faith says, this means nothing to me. And she marries him. 
And together they have built this amazing ministry. His nose is all messed up because he's been beaten for his faith by Hindu militants. When he goes, he goes into these villages all around and preaches and uh, the stories are amazing and he has, he has suffered for his faith and he is a great champion of the faith because someone carved out some space to reach out to some weak, dalit, untouchable, young village man and didn't leave him there. That's what Christ does. And, and that, is, that should be the focus of our ministry. It does trouble me sometimes when I think, it, it seems that in the Christian church, the only thing that resonates with people is celebrity. You know, we got to get the Christian celebrities. But the reality is the work of Christ has gone forward on the backs of the smoldering flax and the broken reeds who have experienced the power of God in their lives and have accomplished great things for God. So it all depends upon God. And the clearest indication that, that we believe that is the way we approach our ministry. And I think Paul understood this. Um, again, when you read the Pauline writings in light of these servant songs, you just find echoes of these songs throughout Paul's writings. So you think of a passage like um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. I'll just read it to you. You can look it up. You probably know it. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. What does this sound like? But instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Well, Paul said, this is my ministry philosophy. I don't strive, but I simply find those who are struggling, entrapped, who are weak and in bondage, and I teach them the word of God, hoping God will not leave them where I find them. What a great approach. That's the servant of the, of the Lord's ministry philosophy, and Paul adapted it. It all depends upon God. That's the first perspective. We have to have that deeply ingrained in our minds. Um, I, I, one of my favorite stories, I'm, I'm an introvert by nature. And uh, my wife will tell you that. I think she almost decided she had to ask me out on our first date. Uh, she didn't do that, but she set everything up so it was impossible for me not to ask her out. She may argue about that, but at any rate. Um, it's by nature, I'm not real outgoing. And... and I got saved, you know, went off to Morrisville, was with Ron, and we had all this fun and did all this stuff and, and went to Bible College. And, and in that short time, I was in a church and I, uh, the pastor there thought, you know, I was hopeless. He was very encouraging, a very great help to me, but I'm sure he thought, this guy's hopeless, you know. Make him a librarian or something. Um, and, and, but, but when the Lord stirred my heart there in that campus at Morrisville and, and I had the opportunity to see people saved. And then I got to go to BBC and get some studying. And I came back to the church, and years later he said, You're, it amazes me what God is doing here. And it was God. It's all God. The way we approach our work demonstrates whether we believe that in the strength of the Lord. But it's not just in this psalm that it all depends on God. Here's one of the things that strikes me in this psalm. And you may not like this, but it seems so clear. It's all about justice. When we think about this task of reaching the world, what should strike us as we read this song, it's all about justice. Three times the servant, it says here in verse 1, he will bring forth or publish justice to the, to the nations. In verse 3, in faithfulness, he will bring forth or publish justice. In verse 4, he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice in the earth. It's all about justice. And that is why our hearts beat to take the gospel to the ends of the world. Because this is a world filled with injustice, with suffering that arises from that. Now this word justice that's used here is, uh, justice is a, maybe a bad translation. It's one that's hard for us to understand because it's a really big word with a big concept. Um, it, it doesn't just relate to judicial fairness or equity before law. Uh, what it talks about, it, it, to maybe paraphrase a great Old Testament theologian, Walter Eich wrote, it's, it's people doing in every area, every relationship of their life, the right thing. 
Now that's really a loose paraphrase. It's doing in every relationship of your life the right thing, doing it God's way. Webb puts it this way. It is the nothing less than to put God's plan for his people into full effect. Jesus put it this way. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is not a minimalist uh, statement. This is not reducing Christianity to the lowest common denominator, stripping out everything that's unnecessary and bringing it down to just some bare essential. This is about the will of God being accomplished in every human being's life globally so the suffering is gone and the hardship is gone so people have water to drink in places where there is no water and so children are not taken advantage of. I was sitting in, in, when we were teaching in India a couple of weeks ago. We were out in the villages outside of uh, Makapur in Andhra Pradesh and um, just really a, a rough setting but... Every afternoon we'd have dinner there and that missionary song we had in Sunday school reminded me of that. Indian food is great, actually, because it really doesn't matter what it's made out of. It tastes good. You know, you pull out a little intestine and you think, oh, I wonder what that was from, or there's always the odd chicken foot in there somewhere. Uh, but, but it always tastes great, so it doesn't matter what's in it. Um, it, it just tastes good. But, but we're sitting there eating lunch in the village every day, and I notice this, this young lady, she lives right across from where we're eating, and, and uh, she's got a, probably about a four-year-old, and then she's got another baby on her hip. And um, I eventually said to my host, I said, how old is she? Oh, well, she's 17. Probably married when she was 14. The light gone out of her eyes. It's hard. I mean, 8,000 women a year die in India because of dowry, bridal dowry disputes. That's, that's one person an hour just over bridal dowry disputes. And this is this, this medieval practice where when a woman gets married, her family becomes obligated to provide some sort of income to the in-laws. And, and if it doesn't come, they harass and they harass and they beat this woman who's living in her in-law's house now. She's kind of like their slave. And they pour gasoline on them and burn them alive because eventually she's no good to us. She doesn't bring any money to us. 8,000 last year died that way. One an hour. And that doesn't even account for the number of women in that situation that hang themselves or kill themselves because their life is just so miserable. And we hear about this and we understand it's all about justice. We live in a world where we want to see people live the way God created them to live. And of course, the inescapable and the always priority First step in this is reconciling men to God through the gospel of Christ. Is proclaiming that Jesus Christ paid for their sin. That Jesus Christ made a way that they could be reconciled to God and indwelt by God's spirit and empowered by almighty God to live in ways that are different from the ways they've been living. That's always the priority. But it's never on its own enough. It's not enough. I speak that from experience. I mean, I worked for 10 years in a community where abuse and addictions were endemic, where you watch the suffering of children and of wives, and you think, you know, okay, they're saved. I'm glad they're saved, and I'm glad they have a community of faith that, that helps them and carries them through this. But, oh, God, that your will could be done on earth like it is in heaven. That's why we take the gospel to the world. That, to me, is why I get so upset when I hear churches say, we only support church planters. Now, maybe you say that, so I apologize in advance if you're saying that, but I don't think you do. I, I know you're a little more mission savvy than that. You know, when I was a church planter, I was a church planter. 
I wanted people to come out that could counsel. I wanted people to come out that could help do educational work, remedial educational work with these kids that are falling through the educational cracks of the system. I wanted people to come out as missionaries to help build orphanages. I wanted them to come out and train people. I would have loved to have someone to come out and train people in my church for a Celebrate Recovery program. We need missionaries that can do all the things that need to be done. Why? Because it's all about justice. And that means that we have to touch every area of human relationships with the claims of Christ and the teaching of the Word of God. And that's why it says in verse 4, till he establishes justice in the earth in his teachings, the islands will put their hope. In his teachings. That's a better translation than just the law, I think. Well, it's, it's, it's a better interpretation than just the law. Because the teaching of Christ covers the full gamut of human relationships. Men alienated from one another. Men and women alienated from God. Hurting each other and suffering. And the American church is well poised to help the global church with some of these more specialized needs, with some of these more troubling manifestations of evil. And we need to do that because it's all about justice. Three times we're reminded of that. Third perspective. It can only end one way. When uh, now I, India was my last trip, so I keep referring to that one. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, I would go to India and live there in a heartbeat. I mean, I, if I were to do nothing else, I think I could give the rest of my ministry life to India, and it would be a good investment. It is going to be the most populous country in the world. It is the church is well poised to be helped to send missionaries all around the world. Um, it's just there is so much potential right now in India, but. Uh, so that's why I keep thinking about it, maybe. Where we were teaching uh, in Bangalore, outside Bangalore, in Devanali, uh, it's a village. And you find this throughout India. We used to see it in South Africa as well, but not on such grand proportions. But in Devanali, as you come into the village, as you would find in many villages, there is a four-story tall um, idol, four stories, of Hanuman, the monkey god. Now, if you go by my table, there's a flag in there with a Hanuman on it. Our Indian people in South Africa would have a prayer at their house and put bamboo poles up in front and then put a Hanuman, ha, Hanuman uh, flag up to protect them because Hanuman is the protector god. And so as you enter into these villages, they'll have these massive idols of this monkey god thinking that he is going to protect. He's the border guardian god who will protect them. And they come and they worship him and they ascribe to him honor and they give thanks to him for their life and for their protection and the fact that a cobra hasn't bit them as they're walking down the road or, or they haven't died from dengue fever or something like that. And they keep thanking and praising Hanuman. And if it isn't in India with that particular idol, you could just think about the United States where people sit down at their dinners and, and they do not bow their heads and say, thank you, God, for providing this because I understand that my health and my strength and everything that I have has flown from your gracious hand, flowed from your gracious hand, and they eat in their own strength and they give praise and glory to their own power. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And they ascribe glory and honor to something other than the one who actually is the source of all glory and honor. And you notice what, where this song ends in verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. I am Jehovah. That is my name. And I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. It only ends one way. And it's not good. It's not a good way. For those who worship Hanumu, ha, Hanuman, can't even say it. Maybe it's because I'm in a church. Um, or for those who worship themselves 
and ascribe glory and honor to themselves and their own abilities and their own powers or though worship some lesser God. It's not good for any of them because ultimately God says in almost militant tones here at the end of the psalm, I will not give my glory to another. They will pay for that. They will pay for that. And their only hope is to repent and to find faith in Christ and the forgiveness that God is willing to offer even though they have done despite to him, even though they have spit in his face, even though they have given his great glory to things that are lesser and not worthy of them, he will forgive them because Jesus died for their sins, because Jesus rose in victory over their sins. But to be sure, the perspective we have to maintain is that is their only hope. Because it's only going to end one way. God ultimately will get the glory. And those who have refused to give it to him will suffer for that. And so, our perspective is we must go. And, and as you gather uh, this weekend and as you reflect upon the sacrifices you've made over the last year and as you reflect upon what you're going to do over the next year, you have to remember, no, this is so very important because it only ends one way. And the only hope is the gospel of Christ because God will reclaim his glory. God will get glory. Three perspectives. It all does depend upon God. We're so grateful for that. It's all about justice. We long for that. That's why we work. That's what encourages our hearts every time we see any outcropping of his perfect design in our world. And it only ends one way. And so we must redouble our resolve to take the light of God to the Gentiles' salvation to the ends of the earth. I trust that, that God will encourage you as you continue to do that as a church and that God will use you and, and send forth from you, send forth from you many more because even though the nations are supplying missionaries in large numbers, there is a phenomenal need for missionaries from here in the United States that can help the global church of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that, that you would help us to maintain the right perspective, to see things clearly, to realize that um, Christ is the hope of the nations. We pray that you would help us to be the servants of the Lord and to act as he acted in, in the power that you alone can give for the ends of justice and truth. Because, Father, this is the only hope people have. We pray for your blessing on this church. I pray that you would continue to use them for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.